because Tarek and I aren't dancers or singers. And that's the best part of all of this. <laughs> is that there is no adult being like, okay, you're singing it wrong. There's no one that doesn't exist. Hello and welcome to The Awardist. I'm Kristen Baldwin from Entertainment Weekly, and I'm thrilled to be joined by the creator and host of The Amber Ruffin Show, Amber Ruffin. Welcome, Amber, and thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. So for people who haven't seen your show, first of all, shame on them. But second of all, how would you describe it and what were you hoping to do with the format? Well, the Amber Ruffin Show is a late night show that's on it nine on peacock and it is you know regular late night show except for the whole second half of it so we do <laughs> a monologue we probably sing a song and we do a bunch of sketches and that's about it it's all kind of topical or semi-topical and it is quite silly. If it seems like politicians spend more time these days talking about Aunt Jemima getting taken off pancake mix and who can use what bathroom than they spend on voter suppression and raising the minimum wage, it's only because you are absolutely correct. So 2020 was a rough year to do literally anything, let alone launch a late night talk show. Um, that said, what would you say, were there any advantages actually to launching your show in such a, an unprecedented year? Yes, a lot of people were like, oh no, we have to do our late night shows and we don't have an audience and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I think they're only thinking about the laughter an audience will give you. The audience also rewards you with silence. No one remembers that. Do you remember when you were telling jokes and no one said a word when no one laughed at all and there's 300 silent people? You know, that's also an option. So <laughs> take that even possibility, like there is no possibility that an audience won't like what you're saying because there is right. no audience. So yeah, that's I good. just took that silence where there would have been laughter, fingers crossed. And in my brain, I just filled it with uproarious laughter. So in my <laughs> mind, at the beginning of each joke I tell, if you look closely, there's an air of like, all right, everybody, calm down. <laughs> because in my mind, the audience is going nuts. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you have said that, you know, you might have an audience down the road. Is that something you're still thinking about? It is something we're thinking about. Um, you never know. But I do hope we get the chance to try it with an audience. And then once we get that audience, I hope we don't regret it. <laughs> <laughs> In your first show after the January 6th insurrection, you said, uh, you said, we're going to do our best to talk about it tonight and to process it. And then we're going to push it aside and try to have some fun. And I felt like that's kind of a great summary of your show's philosophy overall. Is that, would you agree? And if so, like, what, why is that your approach? Yes, we think it is, we feel like everyone should have an adult in their life who calls garbage garbage and so that's really the main sh goal we have us to de-gaslight us yeah. and we are naturally extremely goofy but we also live in this world and if you talk about politics it doesn't mean that everything else has to dry up you know right. you're a complete person and you can be happy and angry and hurt and silly you can be all of those things so we just like to come to the show with our full humanity and let that lead i know it's wrong but you're suffering it brings me joy is it the way you look when you're getting dragged out of the airport baby is it the way you reacted when they said, get off the plane. Is it the way you scream when you realize that you're going to get it? Is it the way you thought that being right was going to save your ass? One of your most 
popular and widely shared segments is called How Did We Get Here, um, which you lay out the history of all sorts of things, oftentimes inequities and racial injustice in America in this sort of fascinating detail. How did this idea come about and how challenging is it to also make it funny because there is humor in it as well? Those are written by three writers. First, Jenny Hagel, our head writer who writes everything. Um, not everything, but damn near. <laughs> and Michael Harriet, who is a writer at The Root. And we tapped him for these specifically because he's great at this. And Ashley Nicole Black, who is now on a Black Lady sketch show and used to be on and write for Samantha B. So those three minds go into a blender and they come out <laughs> with how did we get here and they're really nice because they've had three sets of very smart hands on them so they end up so complete and beautiful we're really lucky yeah and they are they mix in sort of these strains of humor uh like you know one of the most moving ones you did was about anti-asian hate and and even within that, you know, long sort of uh, very detailed history of the history of anti-Asian sentiment in America, there were just some incredibly funny lines like the man who graffitied the ramen shop. One in Texas graffitied a ramen shop. Do you know how stupid and racist you have to be to get mad at soup? Especially when that soup is delicious? Get a grip, racist. And that was one where, I mean, you know, you were visibly moved and emotional at the end. Were you surprised when you read that in the moment about how emotional it made you? Yeah. I've never, yeah. I think that maybe has happened once before, but I, you know, I have decided to just leave it alone. It's like, you can't be emotionless all the time, but it, it just also, at the end of that, I was just like, Ugh, there's more of us and there's more of this the good the like there is no good part to racism it's all bad but like the good part of how terrible it all is it's like well at least it's just us which isn't what I'm thinking in the front of my mind but it's kind of a teensy bit in the back of my mind but if you sit down and think about it for more than two freaking seconds you know oh there's a but ton of us and it's everywhere and it's all the time. That was like what was occurring to me at the end right. of the day. Like, yuck, I could do a million of these. Well, literally everyone, it sucks so bad. Right, exactly. So, and I think it's nice, you know, you know, you're a person. You're not just, a, you know, it's not like you're a robot host or, you know, audience bot 3000, you're a person. And of course you're gonna be affected by this. One of my favorite parts of your show is your interplay with your announcer and sidekick Tarek Davis, like love the two of you together. How long have you known each other? How did you meet? Tell me everything about this friendship. Tarek and I met in Amsterdam in 2004 when we moved there to do Boom Chicago. Boom Chicago is a theater that is not unlike the second city where you know you go there and you're just the theater company and you do shows every single night. And that's how, you know, we've been on stage together all over the world. So, you know, there were also all these corporate gigs you would do and you would do home shows and stuff. And it was like a loud, rowdy show. Um, so like sometimes the audience would be rowdy and we would have to wrangle them. It was the best, it was the <laughs> best. And then we, when I moved here in 2014, we started doing uh, improv shows together on Tarek's improv team, um, CPT. And then I got the show. Do you have a favorite segment you like to do with him? Favorite segment to do with Tarek? No, because you never know what Tarek's going to do. Tarek's liable to do anything. He really is. So you may think you know what he's going to do, but he will always surprise you. And sometimes he'll just like during the monologue, will just be cracking himself up and we will really go on a whole journey and then have to like, reload the whole show and get back to doing the monologue and that's that might be my favorite 
because you never know where we're going to end up. And it's usually singing and dancing, but you never know. When you're putting the show together or you're thinking about things to write about, how do you decide what's song worthy? I usually will have a idea of a type of song I want to do maybe like a couple of them floating around and then I'll read through the news and then if I can make those two things agree then I'll do it yeah it's a weird process I'm more like I want to prance around to this genre wearing this what's the piece of news that fits (laughs) So uh, I do it backwards. So something like, uh, you know, legislation to ban ghost guns immediately, does that spark to you? Like, now I can finally do my Ghostbusters take? (laughs) That was one of our writers, Patrick Rowland, our newest writer, who like, and I got to tell you, when this show started, I was like, I'm not doing no parodies. I don't do that mess. I write my own songs. Because I write freaking songs all the time. Yeah. I'm not singing someone else's songs. It's stupid. But parodies make me laugh so bad. <laughs> they make me laugh so hard. I can't stop it. So I guess this is just part of who we are now. We do yeah. parodies. And it's well, getting... <laughs> there. The number is growing. And that's okay. I mean... Y- you mentioned you write songs. I mean, people may not know you wrote your own musical, about a parody of the documentary King of Kong, which is amazing. So when you write these songs, are you working by yourself, just writing the song or do you work with a team? No, I write the songs and I come up with how it sounds and what I you know, want it to be. And then I make a video and I send it to David Schmoll, who is our musical director. He does all of our tracks. Um, and he was the musical director at Boom Chicago with okay. Tarek and I. So he knows, oh, you know, you're singing it here, but if you want to sing it with Tarek, it needs to be here because we all know each other and he's, and he knows, you know, what kind of, um, uh, phrasing I like. It, it's, it's all like a kind of a mind meld at this point. It's pretty <laughs> cool. Also, he's so great at it that I will send him exactly what I want. And then he will send me that, but way better (laughs) because he's great at it. So it's really nice. So I really never thought anything would beat your song about white supremacists facing consequences. You know, I do have that in my head periodically. Your sadness brings me joy. (laughs) Like, I love it. But then you had to go and drop Dr. Sexy's CDC helpline. Can we hang? Yeah, we can hang. You've got to tell me, which is your favorite and why? My favorite is Bore Me Daddy, which was the Fosse number we did about how boring Joe Biden is. Just because it was so weird. It was a weird song. It was a weird choice. It's weird. It's weird to do a Fosse number. It's weird. It's weird to make Tarek put on eye makeup and suspenders it's weird the whole thing was so weird but it felt together so perfectly because Tarek and I aren't dancers or singers and that's the best part of all of this (laughs) there is no adult being like okay you're singing it wrong (laughs) there's no one that doesn't exist the difference between what we're doing and what a professional does is so great that it makes me laugh so hard like the huge mistakes that are left in because we're like this is good as it's gonna get growing up like what were your what did you have comedy influences were there shows that you first remember loving or that the first thing that made you laugh my family is quite goofy it is bad it, it it's silly everyone in my family is all the way silly whereas usually a mommy and a daddy aren't silly but mine are goof-tastic. <laughs> I think that had a big influence on me, but I guess the an answer to your question is Arthur, the movie oh. Arthur. I still 100% believe it's maybe the funniest movie I've ever seen in my life. It's It makes me laugh so hard. And I saw it just the other day and was crying laughing. <laughs> Freaking six-year-old me or however old I was, was 
hundred percent right. It's hilarious that movie. It's so funny. It's so good. My last question is: the show has been renewed through September. Is that correct? It's true. That's great. Congratulations. What are you? What are some of the things you're looking forward to doing uh, in the coming episodes? Singing more silly songs. That's yes. always my number one favorite. So tomorrow I'm going to do a thing where um, one of the news stories was a guy got bit by a snake that he found in his barbecue and he tried to scoop the snake out with his barbecue tongs. So then we're going to sing a parody of, of thong song with, and call it the tong song. It's so dumb. It's so dumb. It's so silly. But I love it. It truly makes no earthly sense, but it must be done. Well, Amber, it's been so nice talking to you. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on the show. I look forward to seeing the Tong song and everything else that (laughs) you've got coming down the pike. Yay. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. 